welcome to the Psychology Is podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Nick Fortino, and I have the honor of interviewing Dr. Peter Gutsche. Did I say it right? Right. Peter. Right. Uh, and so it's challenging to introduce people like you because you're so well established and accomplished and have done so many different things. So in, in a moment, I'll let you introduce yourself, but I, I just want to say a few quick things here. So as I mentioned, this is the Psychology Is podcast, and we publish podcasts with various figures on various topics. We also make videos related to psychology that are shorter between five and 15 minutes. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate you being here, those of you who are listening and watching. And my goal in interviewing you today is to make it so that people who don't know you and people who do know you and have followed your work for a long time both find it compelling. You know, people who don't know you, I want to make sure they get to hear some of your main points that you make and have been talking about for a long time. And then people who know you well, hopefully this can be an opportunity to hear you talk about things maybe that they haven't heard you talk about or in ways you haven't talked about them. And additionally, I have focused on this topic that we're going to explore today of psychiatry and psychiatric diagnoses and psychiatric drug prescriptions. I've, I've had three main podcast episodes related to this topic with uh, the journalist Robert Whitaker, who's a colleague of yours, with the psychiatrist Dr. Joanna Moncrief, also a colleague of yours, and then we did a recent one on whether ADHD is diagnosed and treated carefully enough in children? And the short answer to that is no. And that was with a psychologist, Dr. Marilyn Wedge. So some people listening and watching now have seen all of those and we're broaching a similar topic that we covered in those episodes, but I wanna make sure that this is still novel. And I can assure our listeners that, you know, this will be cover some of the same ground, but we'll also definitely focus on some different aspects of this main issue. So just wanted to say all that up front here. And at this point, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself now. Okay, so I'm Peter Gertscher from Denmark and uh, I'm a specialist in internal medicine and uh, was professor at Copenhagen University now at Newcastle University, a visiting professor. And I opened the Institute for Scientific Freedom two years ago because uh, scientific freedom is under uh, pressure uh, these years. Um, and um, I have researched in many different areas in my life. And uh, 14 years ago, someone I knew from the Danish Consumer Council came to me and said, well, I would like to do a PhD where I compare benzodiazepines, these uh, sleeping pills, with uh, newer uh, depression pills to see if history has repeated itself. I had done absolutely no research in psychiatry, but just said, great idea, let's do it. And she did it. And we found out that history has repeated itself. When um, val Valium came on the market, people deny that patients could become dependent on drugs like that. And it took decades of misery before it was officially recognized. It also took decades before it was recognized that the newer depression pills like Prozac also cause drug dependence. So history is surely repeating itself. It's like we don't learn anything because psychiatry is very um, dominated by financial interests and guilt interests that are hooked on diagnosing people and prescribing drugs for them. So I have done a lot of research uh, these years and written several books about psychiatry. Um, so my 
field is very broad. I have done research in asthma and oncology, cardiology, hepatology, infectious diseases, a lot of things. I've just published a book about vaccines. Um, but psychiatry is unique. It's the only medical specialty I've ever heard about where the doctors do considerably more harm than good. Not just a little, but vastly more harm. It, it's a total disaster area. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yes. Thank you for that. And just a quick note, I, I didn't read that book yet on about vaccines, but I read many reviews on it and just read a little bit about it. And it seems that you uh, succeeded in doing something that is um, seemingly never done around that topic, which is think in a nuanced way and, and highlight all the gray area. That's perhaps one of the most polarizing topics to discuss with people. And I find that most people are on one extreme end or the other. Either they think that vaccines are always completely effective and say, totally safe for everybody and that they should never be questioned. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who say they're never safe enough and they're not effective enough and you should never consider taking them. And so, again, without having read your book yet, my impression is that you are talking about the more nuanced details and how there may be value and there may be harm that needs to be considered. Is that fair to say? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm impressed that you have seen book reviews on my vaccine book because in its English original, it has only come out as an e-book. Mm. But, but it will come out as a print book in the United States, 1st of June, published by Skyhorse in New York. Mm. Um, and I've just updated the Corona chapter a month ago for mm. the American edition and for the German edition that just came out. So it has appeared also in, uh, in other languages, also small languages like Danish and, and Swedish and Dutch. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and now it just came out in Spain and I have been interviewed by virtually all the major newspapers. Mm. So, so I think you are right that I hit a proper scientific balance there. And some vaccines are just extraordinarily good, like the measles vaccine. We should all have it. Measles have killed millions of people, polio vaccines and so on. And then we have the COVID-19 vaccines, but uh, let's not discuss that tonight, but uh, I hope it will save the lives of a lot of people. Mm. Well, yeah, th honestly, thank you for, for turning your attention to that and writing about that. It's just such an important topic that I think we can all afford to just be a little bit more calm about when discussing because yes. it, it requires you know, a clear, calm state of mind to really yeah. scientifically analyze something. And it's just such a triggering topic for people and it's such an identity issue that it's yes. very difficult. It's very difficult to have productive conversations. So thank you for, for writing that. Um, and yes, good good call that we, we can go ahead and stop going down that road now because uh, that could be a whole <laughs> very long oh, yeah. conversation. But but now we'll, yeah, we'll talk about psychiatry and um, your newest book, is called Mental Health Survival Kit and, and uh, Withdrawal from Psychiatric Drugs. I think I got the title right. Yes. And you, you self-published it. And so I just want to ask quickly, how, how would you like me to make it available to the audience here? I'll put a link in the description to the Institute of Scientific Freedom. And I know that you have different ways that people can uh, donate when they read your, read your book. So would the, would the link to your website be sufficient? Oh, yes. People can buy the book directly via the website. Okay. Uh, so that's very easy. Okay, perfect. So yeah. I'll put that link in the description. I highly encourage people to read it. And what I want to say about it, first of all, having read it myself and preparing to talk to you, is that you you certainly pull no punches. You, have, you don't hold back in your very um, fierce criticism of psychiatry. And I firmly believe that that's 
warranted to criticize it fiercely. You know, and one of the lines that you say, and you just actually said it a couple minutes ago uh, in the beginning of your book is that psychiatry does vastly more harm than good. Um, and you also say that you make a good point that um, there's this phrase, which is the phrase psychiatric survivor. And to, to that kind of says it all because there's yes. no, there's no other medical specialty where we say we survived despite our exposure to seeing that type of doctor. You know, usually people yeah. say I'm a cancer survivor and that's thanks to medicine, but yeah. no one, you know, but psychiatric survivor that it really does says it all. It means that I actually, you know, endured and survived the harmful interventions that were prescribed to me. So, so let me, let me start by asking you a general question and then we'll get into the specifics. What do you see is, you know, the, the main harm that is being done when you make a statement like psychiatry is more harmful than good? What types of harm are you talking about? Well, let's start with the worst harms, mortality. It is pretty difficult to find out how many people are killed by psychiatric drugs every year because the randomized trials where half of the patients get placebo, they ought to be the best documentation we have. <clears throat> but these trials are flawed. For example, half of all deaths and half of all suicides are simply missing. They are not published. So this is what we call fraud. And, um, and not only that, um, you construct these trials that you usually have people who are already in treatment, almost always. Then you have what you call a placebo washout period where they don't get, for example, the depression pill they have been on for a long time. And then they are randomized to placebo or another depression pill. And then what happens is that some people become abstinent. They get horrible withdrawal symptoms when they no longer get their pill. And these symptoms increase the risk of suicide, violence, and even homicide. So you create an artificial increase in risk of dying in the placebo group, and therefore it becomes difficult uh, to find out how lethal these drugs are. Mm. So to give you one example, uh, the trials in schizophrenia are totally unreliable for this reason, that you introduce a pretty large death risk in the placebo group. So you are harming the patients. These trials are unethical, but that's how they are done. Then I thought, if I go to old people, then they likely did not get an antipsychotic, for example, before they were randomized to placebo and an antipsychotic. So then I looked at these trials, and then I could see that, um, that uh, for every 100 people treated for a few weeks, two were killed by the drug compared to placebo, two, two percent. This is a very high death risk for any drug in medicine. So if you treat for a whole year, the death risk will be higher than two percent, of course. So I have tried to do my best. And in a book I published six years ago, I estimated that psychiatric drugs uh, may be the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. And maybe I have exaggerated it a bit, but there is no doubt that these drugs kill a huge number of people. And if you turn to depression pills, which I never call antidepressants, because this suggests that they are effective towards depression, which they really aren't. Uh, we now know that these pills double the risk of suicide. We have known that for a long time they did so in children and adolescents. Now we know it's also a fact for adults. Mm -hmm. So why on earth do you treat depression 
where what we fear most is suicide with pills that double the risk of suicide. This tells you how bad current psychiatry is. Mm. My daughter who studies psychology and I, we have done a review of psychotherapy in people who were admitted acutely after a suicide attempt. So they were at high risk for a new suicide attempt. And what we found was that when they got psychotherapy compared to usual therapy, which does not mean that you turn your back on the patients, but you are kind to them and try to help them. But if you use psychotherapy, you actually halved the risk of a new suicide attempt. Mm. So we have psychological therapies that can halve the risk of a new suicide attempt. And we have pills that double the risk of suicide. And what do we do? We use pills and very little psychotherapy. This just tells you how incredibly awful this is. Mm. I, I just heard only today a new tragic case. I was contacted by a good friend uh, whose friend's uh, husband was depressed and she wanted to get advice and I told her to read my new book. Uh, uh, then she and her husband would realize that the worst thing he could do was to go to and see a psychiatrist because then he would likely come on pills. But unfortunately, people believe in authorities. So even though I want them, he went to a psychiatrist and he was put on pills and he has just hanged himself. Of course, I don't know if it was the pills, but we know that they double the risk of suicide. And what is characteristic of these depression pills is that uh, the, the suicide methods are usually violent. People hang themselves, they shoot themselves, they jump off bridges. Whereas if people normally try to kill themselves, it's with pills. They take mm -hmm. too many pills of some kind, you know. Mm -hmm. But what is characteristic of depression pill suicides is that the, the measures, the means people use are violent ones. Mm -hmm. They want to be sure that they succeed because mm -hmm. they suffer terribly from the side effects of the pills, mm -hmm. which can drive them into suicide. And that's, that's what I was going to ask you is why, like, what explains this? What exactly are the pills doing that increase the likelihood of suicide? And I'll just say one thing that I've, I've heard explained from multiple sources that one of the reasons that suicide increases once you start taking these drugs is that they generally suppress regions of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex, that inhibit particular certain actions. So a person, when they're not, when their prefrontal cortex is not suppressed, might think, I'm just gonna kill myself today, I'm gonna shoot myself. But then there's this other impulse that inhibits that. There's a voice that says, no, I can't do that. There's all these people love me, I can't do that. But essentially that inhibiting mechanism of the brain that stops us from doing certain things is suppressed by depression pills. So well, go ahead, please elaborate on, on why, why else? This, this is one of the many lies in psychiatry. This specialty is full of lies. I would characterize this explanation as pure bullshit. It is armchair reasoning, witchful thinking. This has never been documented. Whereas the, the real mechanism behind depression pill suicides has been documented. We know what it is. And it's not what you tell me. Um, one of the adverse effects of depression pills is that it can make some people extremely restless. They develop something called akathisia. This is Greek for I cannot sit still. So people may wander frantically around and cannot sit still anywhere. They describe it sometimes they want to jump out of their own body. And it's an absolutely horrible 
condition that increases the risk of suicide and violence dramatically. And the worst thing is that people don't realize it could be the pills. They think it's themselves that have become crazy. So they can see no other way out than to kill themselves. This is one very well documented mechanism, a side effect of the pills. Another effect of the pills is emotional blunting, that you care less about anything. You care less about yourself. You care less about your loved ones, which contradicts what you just told me, because then the person might not care that my mom and dad will be sorry if I kill myself. They just don't care and they do it. So this is another mechanism. Then we have a third mechanism that rarely people on depression pills can become psychotic. This can also drive people into suicide. Mm. And I just want to say too, I, I, I remember reading in your book the the terms that you suggest we start using for each of the different categories of these drugs. And I, I think we can we can go ahead and start using this this terminology and people who are listening and watching can be up to speed with us here. So instead of calling them antidepressants, you suggest we call them depression pills. It's more honest. It doesn't give this misleading suggestion that it is a, goes against depression. So depression pills. And then for um, the antipsychotics, I believe you suggested the term um, sedatives or neuroleptics. Yeah. There's, there's yeah, neuroleptics. Let me explain. Go ahead. Let me explain the history of this. Please. When the so-called antipsychotics were developed, people called them major tranquilizers because they knock people down so they can't function. Benzodiazepines were called minor tranquilizers, but it's actually a question of dose. If you give enough of a benzodiazepine, you can put people to sleep so you can operate on them. So it's a question of dose, but then they were called neuroleptics, which is Greek for grabbing the nerves, I think would be the English expression. And then that didn't look so good either. So then they be became known as antipsychotics, but, but the fact is that they do not have any true antipsychotic effect. They sedate people, as you just said. And when people get these drugs, it becomes more difficult for them to return to a normal life. So they might continue on them for the rest of their lives and their lives are spoiled because of these pills. And if, if you give them to normal people like you and me, we would also be heavily sedated and would have difficulty concentrating, difficulty doing anything that is their effect. They don't have any specific effect against the psychosis. Right. I, I mean, they, they, can, they can make your psychotic thoughts less intensive, but then they make all your thoughts less intensive. Mm -hmm. It's not specific. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have a long background in infectious diseases and, and we have antimicrobial agents, antibiotics, which is a very good term because if you kill dangerous bacteria you may survive so these drugs are uh, help you survive so they are truly antimicrobial agents so it's it, you see it all the time in psychiatry you have a lot of lies and then you have a lot of smaller lies which we usually call bullshit because they are not true, but without being direct lies, we, we may call them bullshit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to emphasize here and bring in is it's important for people to understand what is behind the credentials of the professional that they're going to see for help. And many people, it's a bit of a mystery, you know, what a PhD, what an MD, and what specifically a psychiatrist's background is in their education. 
So I, I, I just want to say, like, you know, if there are any psychiatrists listening right now, I know that there's a percentage of psychiatrists who are great, who don't overdiagnose and overprescribe. I think this is a relatively small percentage, but I just want to acknowledge that I, I would never question the intelligence of psychiatrists or anything like that. It's the principles of the practice that we're really criticizing. And the fact that, you know, you put it, you get a nice analogy that if you want meat, don't go to a bakery. And you use that analogy to describe if you want health, I mean, help with mental health, don't go to someone, don't, don't go to a psychiatrist was your point. And the reason for that is that psychiatrists are not trained in psychology. They're not necessarily trained in specifically understanding mental and emotional dynamics. They're training their, their medical doctors. So they go to medical school and they become experts in anatomy and physiology and disease epidemiology. And you can, of course, correct me or add to this because you actually did that. But the point is that psychiatrists are not experts in psychology. And yet people who are suffering psychologically, emotionally, seek a psychiatrist for help, and they may be under the wrong impression about what the expertise of a psychiatrist really is. And then when you consider that, it starts to make more sense that so many people will meet with a psychiatrist and within minutes, less than 10 minutes usually, there's, they have a diagnosis and a prescription for a drug. Yes. Um, let me see how I can best uh, tackle what you just said. First of all, I also want to acknowledge the good psychiatrists. I know many of them, but they are very, very small in number. They are drops in the ocean, unfortunately. So that's why you should not go to a psychiatrist if you get a mental health problem. It's far too dangerous. Uh, you should seek. You should go to a, a psychologist or someone else who has an education in psychotherapy. Um, but people are realizing to they're realizing more and more that psychiatry has been a huge failure the so-called biological psychiatry that tells you that uh, you have a, a chemical imbalance in your brain. That's why you became ill. That's the worst of all lies in psychiatry. It's totally wrong. Uh, and then people get hooked on pills and think, well, I have a chemical imbalance, so I need this drug for the rest of my life, of course. So it's making things worse to tell people lies like this. Mm -hmm. And, and um, people are now realizing, the good psychiatrists, that this is just so horribly wrong. So I'm a member of, for example, the Critical Psychiatry Network, which is uh, based in the UK and mainly has UK psychiatrists as members, but I have also been allowed to be there. And I'm not the only critical voice. There are many good critical voices there. And uh, Joanna Moncrief is one of them, and I, I know her, I have met with her. She is very good. Sammy Timimi, a child psychiatrist, is another one. Um, so um, there is a limit as to how long you can sustain a totally sick system, which is what psychiatry is today. And I see a good development in many places and many countries. For example, more and more soteria-like homes in more and more countries uh, after the uh, Lapland model in northern Finland, where people are taken care of immediately when they develop a psychosis. And you don't jump on them with uh, these horrible drugs. You actually talk to them and don't use these uh, neuroleptics as much as in the rest of the world. And you have far better long-term outcomes. Mm -hmm. These people come back to work and school at a hugely greater rate than those who get antipsychotics. And people realize this more and more, but it's, it's far too slow. Far too many people 
are killed in the process or develop permanent brain damage. Mm. So we, the process, the change needs to be much quicker and we need to develop a radically different psychiatry. The, the way psychiatry is constructed today that that you go and see a psychiatrist and then you are interviewed and then the psychiatrist has some checklist for various diagnoses. And these checklists are very, very unscientific and highly unreliable. And I can give you just one example. When I lecture for ordinary people, I expose them to the checklist for adult ADHD. And at every single lecture, between one third and one half test positive. I've even tried in my own close family, my wife and I, my youngest daughter and her boyfriend, we all could get the adult ADHD diagnosis. But we are normal. And my youngest daughter's boyfriend, he is very laid back very calm. You would never expect him to be able to qualify for that diagnosis, but he did. Mm. So, and, and then I explained to people, you, well, some of the most important people I have ever met in this, this world, they will qualify for the ADHD diagnosis because these people are energetic, dynamic people who don't want to waste their time and therefore leave a lecture if it's too dull or move around on their chair like children do when they get the HDHD diagnosis because they are bored. Mm. It's horrible. And then they get these drugs that, that are speed on prescription. They work like amphetamine and sometimes they are amphetamine. Mm. Yes. And, you know, I, I feel like of, of all the criticisms that can be made, perhaps the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest one is psychiatric drugs in children. To oh, me, yes. This is just the most appalling and easily deconstructible practice. It's, it's really unbelievable to me that, that this is becoming so commonplace. And um, you make a, you know, a good point that we wouldn't, if, if someone said to a circle of friends, yeah, my kid's like really anxious. So I just put a little whiskey in their orange juice every morning. Everyone would look at them like, are you crazy? Or if yeah. I said, you know, yeah, sometimes when my kid's a little active, I just let them, you know, hit my joint of cannabis. They would be like, what? Put this parent in jail. Where's child protective services? But then yeah. when we, but then we, we just accept it as normal to and, and it's because an authority figure is saying to do so so i wouldn't necessarily fault the parents but we accept it as normal to give kids adderall and amphetamines and all the psychiatric drugs you know many people don't even don't even question it let let me tell you this uh in america they did a large trial of uh, an adhd drug i think it was ritalin and they followed up the children over many years. When they published their 16 year results, I think it was, you could see that those children who had most carefully taken their drugs throughout all these years, they were five centimeters, two inches shorter than those children who had taken very little, two inches. And, and uh, I, I have just looked into study reports for fluoxetine given to children. These um, trials that uh, allowed it to be approved in the States and elsewhere for children. And I have seen the same, that after a few weeks treatment with Prozac, uh, the children, they lose both height and weight compared to those who get placebo. Mm. And we are not talking about a few millimeters or grams. What I'm talking about is a full centimeter and a full kilo after a few weeks of treatment. So if they are treated for a whole year and that continues, you can calculate yourself how much that is. But this is what is so easily observable that your increase in height and weight is abnormal. 
And then you might speculate, okay, what is it these drugs are meant for? They are they're working on children's brains. What do they look like? Is brain impair is brain development also being impaired by Ritalin and Prozac? I think it is. Mm. It's really, really scary and disgusting. Mm. I published a book about uh, the drug industry eight years ago that I called Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime, How Big Pharma Has, has Corrupted Healthcare. In that book, I had two chapters about psychiatry, and one of them was called Pushing Ch Children into Suicide with Happy Pills. Come on, little child, I have a happy pill for you that will make you happy. I won't tell you it will double your risk of committing suicide. Th this is like sexual child abuse, isn't it? Like luring children with candy to mm. become sexually abused. I mean, it's, I don't have words for this. I, I just think it's, it's, it's so horrendous that I just, I just don't have words for it, other than this is a crime against humanity. Mm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. And I think often parents, again, I, I, I'm imagining um, some a parent listening to us talking right now whose child is on a, one drug or another, and so just, I would just want to emphasize, you know, we know you're a loving parent and we know that you probably sought help out of desperation and that certain behaviors in, in your child are probably very difficult to deal with. Uh, but I guess the point right now is just, there are much better solutions. And specifically those are related to psychology and environmental factors. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a parent to feel ashamed because often there's just no. a, a general, you know, lack of awareness of the harms of these drugs. And it's difficult to question your doctor. I think especially in the U.S., we are thoroughly conditioned never to question a, a, the doctor. The doctor knows best is like a thought that's programmed into our minds. And so it takes a lot of courage and just um, to be quite informed, to ever even think to question the doctor's prescription. So yeah. just wanted to emphasize that. And um, let, let's talk quickly about the chemical imbalance that you brought up. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute, Nick, because I have something important to add now. Please, please. Um, uh, and that is um, that to take people off psychiatric drugs, can be very difficult and virtually no doctors know how to do it. It might be okay in the beginning, but when doses become very small, doctors tend to think, oh, they are so small now, so I can just stop. Mm. But if you look at, at the pharmacology of these drugs, then when you are down in small doses, you have to be extra careful because even though the doses may seem small to you and smaller than what you can buy at a pharmacy, then if you suddenly remove the last little dose, then the last step will be too big for many people. Mm. So they will develop withdrawal symptoms and will feel in a terrible shape. And then their doctors are likely to say, there you see, you still need the drug. But this is like telling an alcoholic that doesn't have more alcohol. There you see, you still need alcohol. Mm. You wouldn't do that. But, but since these are officially approved drugs, you make these errors all the time. So, of course, children can be difficult. Human beings can be very difficult. But if you are an adult, you know that it is not the right thing to do if you have difficulties to start drinking or to start using illegal drugs, they, you know that this is the wrong way forward. So why do we think it is the right way forward for our children? We, we don't give them alcohol, but we do give them other 
substances that influence their brain. Mm. This is not the right way forward. It's very simple. So what would you say yeah. then? What would you say when a person has, you know, titrated their dose down and they're at a very small dose and the goal is to get their child or themselves off of this drug, what, what would you advise? Well, um, some years ago in 2016, Bob Whitaker and I and a few other people um, established the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, mm. which is located in Göteborg in Sweden. And we have had some meetings. The last one was very international with people from many countries, including India, Brazil, United States, and so on, Israel, um, Greek, Greece. And um, we discuss how best to withdraw people there in this community we have. And um, the book about mental health that I published last summer became so popular that uh, volunteers translated it for absolutely free mm. into Spanish, almost nothing to translate it into French. It was translated into Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, so it has come out in a number of languages and also published by book publishers in some of the languages. And uh, I, I have quite many pages there devoted to how you can withdraw people safely. Um, and it also describes that you should not do this alone. It can be difficult. Uh, the patient should not do it alone. But even if you help a patient and doesn't have any background, it is an advantage if you can find someone who has experience in how to do this. And some of these people, the best of them, are psychiatric survivors who have found out the hard way how they shall do it and how they shall, for example, use a nail file and file small bits of a tablet so that they can get sufficiently small doses that you cannot buy anywhere. So there is an instruction in my book how you can do it. Hmm. Okay, excellent. I'll just mention too that when I did my dissertation, I was interested in the the line of research that is it hasn't exactly died out, but it was much more prominent in the 60s and 70s and 80s when uh, a psychiatrist by the name of Abram Hoffer was attempting to treat schizophrenia and depression with high doses of various vitamins and particularly vitamin B3 niacin. And the results are mixed. He was, uh, I mean, generally Abram Hoffer would conclude that it was a viable treatment that everyone should know about. And so I, I was, you know, a little skeptical and curious and wanted to see for myself. So I didn't conduct an experiment where I administered it, but I, I conducted a multiple case study where I found people who met a very specific criteria, which were a schizophrenia diagnosis, and then that they had been prescribed Risperdal, a commonly prescribed drug for schizophrenia, that they had then introduced this, what is known as an orthomolecular treatment, so high doses of niacin, and then that, that it was successful. I wanted to talk to people who found that this treatment really helped and it helped them, number one, um, get off of the drug and withdraw from the drug and it helped keep their schizophrenic symptoms under control. And in short, the people that I did case studies on reported that, and, and of course, case study interviewed their family, their friends, their doctors, they reported that it actually really helped, that they felt that the vitamin support uh, really made the withdrawal symptoms much less intense. So, you know, I think what I can conclude from that is that certainly more research is warranted on the, the way that nutritional support can help reduce the intensity of withdrawal symptoms. I think this is something for people to keep in mind. Please allow me to comment on this. Please. And please, please don't cut it out okay. of, the inter of the interview. I, I have written the chapter in the textbook for medical students in Copenhagen, in the whole of Denmark, about alternative medicine. 
and also molecular medicine is a kind of alternative medicine. So I have studied this mm. and I must warn people about it. It is not based on good science and vitamins come up all the time. Now people also claim that vitamins are good for COVID-19 and uh, vit vitamins always pop up. And whenever you study vitamins in randomized trials, almost always you get disappointed. Mm. So you have you are referring to some cases and if you pick some cases, you can show that almost anything seems to be effective. So I would, I would warn you about this. There is nothing in the way of nutrition, including vitamins that ha has ever been shown to be helpful in mental health. Mm. You need to deal with people's mental health problems in a psychological way. Uh, right. Not by drugs, not by vitamins, not by eating more or less fat or carbohydrates or whatever. This has never been shown to be of any value. So I would like to warn people about this. I appreciate that. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm disappointing you there. No, I, honestly, it, it doesn't feel disappointing. I have no in identity invested into this. I have no okay. attachment to it, honestly. I, yeah. Although I, I will say it. I would be surprised if nutrition had nothing to do with emotional stability and mental health. But I also, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I guess my impression based on everything I've read in the literature about this is that perhaps the value could be that someone who is sufficiently nourished, who really does, isn't depleted or deprived or deficient in any kind of major nutrients, perhaps they're just a little bit more emotionally stable. And that and is a supportive element in dealing with their issues. What would you say? Well, we can raise we can raise all sorts of hypotheses. But there are so many nutritionists in this world who have done so much research. And I have yet not seen anything that is useful in terms of mental health problems. Mm. We, know, uh, we, know, uh, we know very few things, like if you eat too much sugar, it rewards your reward system in the brain in a similar way as amphetamine does. So you might become sugar craving, but I mean, of course, you should not drown yourself in sugar because that's not healthy and then you will get fat. So you shouldn't do that anyway. Uh, you should have a varied diet and eat what you like. That's what I do. I don't worry about what I eat. I eat a very varied diet and not too much sugar. That's it. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Nick, but uh, I, again, uh, it's not it, it's not disappointing. It's not disappointing to me. I, I don't People people should focus on this wonderful tune by McFerrin. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Live your life. It's the only one you will ever get. And I'm without I, without I, I, crutches, without crutches in terms of alcohol, psychiatric drugs, tobacco, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I certainly um, think that the, you know, when we use the term biopsychosocial organisms, the psychosocial factors, are, I definitely have concluded that those are the factors that relate to emotional and mental well being. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess. And, and I guess not Go ahead, please. Yeah, now that you mention this term, biopsychosocial uh, factors, then we tend to disregard the social factors enormously. Mm. When people become psychotic, you can see that they have very often been severely traumatized many years earlier, for example, sexually abused as a child or abused in other ways, increases the risk of subsequent psychosis. And uh, if you start looking at these things, why do so many people get a depression diagnosis? 
Well, that's very easy because they live depressing lives. They have a wrong husband or a wrong, um, um, what is the opposite, wife. Uh, uh, or they have a, a, a hostile boss or a wrong job or a lot of things may be wrong. And then you get sad and depressed. I mean, a pill cannot help you there. Mm. I think this is such an important point. And I, I also think it's important for people to frame depression and anxiety, for example, as feedback about your life. And yes, I find that, you know, when you, for example, when you look at someone who, who drinks too much alcohol, what tends to happen is that they basically, they numb all the, all the feelings that they don't want to be feeling. But the problem is that those feelings are meant to be guiding. They're like alarms that indicate that something's not quite right in the way I'm living or in my circumstances, situations or relationships. And oh, yeah. if we were to frame it that way, then we would respond much differently. I mean, we would have a different relationship to the depression or anxiety because yeah. we would we would think of it again like as a guide, as a signal. Yeah. And then and then we would make different, you know, changes. Yeah. So I, that, I, ag I agree so much with what you just said. And I wrote about it in one of my books, not a psychiatry book, but another one. Uh, imagine you have a broken leg. And then you have a lot of people with broken legs. And then you randomize them to aspirin or placebo. And then you conclude, oh, aspirin works on broken legs because mm -hmm. people have less pain. Great analogy. But it won't heal your leg. Yeah. And, and therefore, I, I have a chapter in another book that I, that I call emotional pain. And then I have a chapter called physical pain. So if you treat emotional pain with psychiatric drugs, with these rating scales that psychiatrists use, then you can say, oh, well, yeah, your emotional pain is slightly, le slightly less. So your, your drug may be working, but do you become mentally healthy? No, that's like the broken leg. Mm. It's an excellent point. This is... Thank you. Thank you for alerting me to this, Nick. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, I think it's just such an important paradigm shift that we need culturally when it comes to framing these difficult emotions and that if we start to look at them as signals that should help oh, yeah. motivate us to change things up or change our habits, then it's a whole different way of approaching these issues. I forgot. I forgot to say that. So thanks for reminding me that um, pain is nature's warning signal. Mm. If you have done too much sports and you get a tendinitis, nature tells you you cannot play football for a while or tennis or golf or whatever you do. You need to rest. Mm. And emotional pain is very much the same. It's a warning signal from nature. There is something wrong with your life. And if you numb that pain with arthritis drugs, if it's physical pain, then you can make things worse because an acute sports injury can become chronic if you dull it with painkillers. So your problem may become worse. Mm. And it's exactly the same in psychiatry that if you dull your feelings, you become emotionally numb. Mm. Then you don't solve the problem, but you run a risk that it will become worse. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what happens is when it gets worse and there's any level of recognition of that, it's even more daunting, which then increases the sense of dependency on the the emotionally dulling substance. Yeah. Whereas if we were to take the, the feelings that we're experiencing as signals right away, then it's like we haven't gone too far off course and it's easier to get back on course. But when we go years of depending on a substance that numbs the feelings, 
then again, when there's any level of recognition of how far off course my life has gotten, it's so daunting to think about making all the necessary changes that people just succumb to the dependency and, and just accept the circumstances and their habits and it becomes status quo, they get stuck. Yeah, and, um, and if you are not mentally healthy and you contact a psychologist, then that psychologist's main task is to try to direct you back to mental health, mm -hmm. to good health, to, to escort you back to where you once came from. So your normal condition is condition one, and you are not mentally healthy, that's condition two. And the psychologist will try to escort you back toward condition one. Now, what does psychiatric drugs, uh, a psychiatric drug do? It creates an artificial condition three, mm. which is a totally new territory where you have never been. So you are neither condition one or condition two, you are in a third unknown territory. Mm. How will you get from there back to the normal condition? That's not so easy. Mm. Great way to put it. And this is something that came up in conversations I had with Robert Whitaker and Joanna Moncrief, but <clears throat> just this idea of like what it means when a drug works. And as you've said in different ways today, so obviously a psychoactive substance is going to produce an effect. That's yes. We can always expect that. And when yeah. and then some and when that effect that effect is just going to be different than what you're experiencing when you're sober, when you're anxious or depressed. It's just going to be a different effect. So whether that so in a sense, it works in that it's effective, but it's not effective in restoring mental health. That's the problem. It's just subdues an individual or, or maybe stimulates them with the stimulants. But the point is that the word works in psychiatry does not mean optimal functioning. It does not mean thriving. It does not mean happiness. So no. I, I just no. think that's, that's worth pointing out you know that when people say yeah this drug works well sure alcohol works well, too and it's like no surprise that a psychoactive substance has an effect exactly you can show in a trial that alcohol works right but we don't prescribe alcohol for depression yeah so let's let's touch just quickly on the chemical imbalance theory, because I think you offer a couple of really good analogies in the book and, and it can, in a sense, put the biological psychiatry model to rest because you say, yeah, yeah. and I want, I'm going to let you talk about this, but I'll set you up by saying, um, this could very well be, so first of all, often there's not even any neurological abnormality, first of all, in many cases. And even if we do find that there's some type of excess level of dopamine or deficiency of serotonin, that doesn't mean that that's what caused the depression. Rather, this could be a classic case of correlation, not equaling causation. And yeah. that you can expect that whatever the mental emotional state of the individual is, it will be reflected neurologically. Yeah. But that doesn't yeah. mean that, like you said, when you find ashes after a house has burned, it doesn't mean that the ashes caused the fire. It's just what has happened once something burned. So, so yes. can you can you speak to this? Uh, yeah, you... yeah. It's 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 great you take it up. I was challenged by a professor uh, of neurology when I arranged a big international meeting in Copenhagen some years back, and we discussed the chemical imbalance lie during the discussion section. And I, I explained this to him. Once in Africa, I was suddenly alone because I was making a film and the rest of the party had left and there I was alone. And I became very scared. It was in a national park. What should I do if there was a lion behind the next rock? I would be scared to death. 
when you become very scared, your stress hormones skyrocket, adrenaline, cortisol. So if somebody had measured my hormones, if I saw this lion, if they were psychologists, they, and they were psychiatrists, they might have concluded, oh, there you see, you became scared because uh, your level of, of uh, epinephrine and uh, cortisol were too high. No, my friend, it was the other way around. Mm. I became scared and then my stress hormones skyrocketed. You see? Yes. It's not so difficult if you use such allegories. Then people understand what you're trying to tell them. And, and actually, I haven't seen good research that has found any major dif differences between normal people and people with various psychiatric diagnoses. So the whole idea about a chemical imbalance, it's stone dead. Stone. But an Australian researcher and I investigated websites in 10 countries. And, and we found that in three uh, quarters of those websites, still the lie about the chemical imbalance about depression was propagated. Mm. It's stone dead, uh, but patients still hear about it. Right. You I mean, I mean, would a would a cardiologist invent a total lie for you? If you came in and there was a problem with your heart? Would the cardiologist tell you, oh, it's because you have a chemical imbalance in some strange substance in your blood? Out of the blue. No cardiologist would do that. Right. The psychiatrists do it, although they never showed it to be right. Right. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Like This is really worth emphasizing that to think that you can just sit there, observe someone's behavior and hear them talk and then just accurately diagnose what's going on in their brain it's no. truly absurd you can't do that right <laughs> <laughs> it's absurd there's a quote i want to read from your book which i think is important you wrote that the biological model right which is what we're talking about the whole idea that there's a chemical imbalance balance causing your condition the biological model generates undue pessimism about the chances of recovery and reduces efforts to change compared to a psychosocial explanation. And I just think that that's a point that really needs to be heard. And it's absolutely true. When people are told your brain is messed up, you, you have a chemical imbalance, it does generate pessimism because they're like, oh man, well, I guess this is just the brain I have. So what drugs do I need to fix it? Yeah. So it's uh, people are being fooled, like you can see in old Western movies with snake oil. Mm -hmm. It's a total hoax. Whereas in other specialties, it's very different. I mean, now if, if a man uh, um, has blood clots and has suffered angina and a myocardial infarction, a heart attack and so on, because he, he is more likely to produce blood clots than other people. And then you have a drug like aspirin that can reduce the risk of producing blood clots. It's beautiful. Mm. This is how medicine should be. Yes. It's a cause and effect model. And you know what you are doing. And you have shown in big randomized trials that if you give such people aspirin, many more of them will survive than if you don't do it. Mm. That's how it should be. In psychiatry, it's the other way around. That the more psychiatric drugs you give to people, the more you kill. Hmm. It's absurd. It, it really, really is. And, and I hope that people listening who have been diagnosed with something, which is probably a fairly high percentage, given that the diagnostic overexpansion that has been happening uh, over the years, the criteria are so broad. There are so many conditions that it's quite likely most people would be diagnosed with at least one mental disorder. So for anyone listening who has been diagnosed, I hope that what we're talking about ultimately results in a sense of optimism and a shift in the way in which you're framing uh, your 
mental and emotional experiences. Because like you said, you know, a psychosocial explanation, when you start to understand that what I'm feeling may be due to something like, as an example of a psychological source, unresolved trauma or maladaptive habits, yeah. or it could be circumstantial. It could be the, yeah. my living environment. It can be societal. And when you start to think of it in those terms, there are just, it's, it breeds optimism because you see how you can actually um, control the outcome a little bit more. You can make changes that will directly yeah. affect things. But let, let's go back to where we started. Yeah. If you have a mental health problem, don't look up a psychiatrist. It can be the worst error in your whole life. Because a psychiatrist will find one or more diagnoses for you. And then there are the drugs that come with the diagnosis. And since the drugs are rather poorly effective, the likelihood is that before long you will be on more than one drug. Mm. And these drugs, they have side effects that look like the symptoms psychiatrists use when they come up with new diagnoses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For example, if you give Ritalin to a child, the child may develop side effects from Ritalin that looks very much like the criteria that psychiatrists use to diagnose bipolar disorder. Mm. And then the child get another diagnosis. Now you have also become bipolar. And then the child get more dangerous drugs. Um, and I once asked a professor of psychiatry, when the symptoms are more or less the same, how do you know if it's not a side effect of Ritalin or it is a genuine bipolar disorder? And you know, his, you will never guess his reply. Tell me. Yeah, yeah, I'm a psychiatrist. I can distinguish between these two situations. I mean, it's 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 more or less the same symptoms. Hmm. So in my view, it should be a crime to come up with additional psychiatric diagnosis for a patient who is already under chemical influence because it can very likely just be side effects of the drugs. Right. I mean... If you get a totally confused patient in from the street who has taken LSD or too much marijuana or cocaine or whatever and has become psychotic, you don't tell that patient, oh, 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 I think you have schizophrenia. No, right. you wait and see what person is behind these drugs when they are out of the body. Beautiful. You don't do that in psychiatry. You go from one drug to the next diagnosis, to the next drug, to the next diagnosis. And after a while, you have forgotten who you were mm. many years earlier when you were not under chemical influence. This is kind of what you talk about with medication spellbinding, the inability to accurately assess. Yeah, this one. is... Uh, this is uh, a term that Peter Bregan, mm -hmm. a psychiatrist in Ithaca, New York State, invented. And it's a beautiful term because when people are under these influences of psychiatric drugs, they are no longer able to judge themselves. And uh, it's not strange, actually. They, but they might tell you that they feel good on the drugs. But if the drugs were taken off them, they might realize that wasn't the case. I just thought so. I had become used to my new self under drug influence. Mm. So they are spellbound. They are no. They are no. Not able to evaluate their own condition, which is very understandable. And we all know how it is if we drink too much alcohol, and and think I can easily drive the car mm. home. Then we hope there is a good friend that would tell us, No, you can't. Give me the car keys. It's more or less the same situation. Right. Hmm. So let's, let's turn now. I would love to hear your views on basically like worst possible case scenario and best case scenario 
for our future and specifically the future of treating people who are experiencing any variety of you know mental disorders depression and anxiety in particular but also like you know what people call adhd and just problematic behaviors in general so what what is your view first of all about what if we don't make any changes on a big level what if psychiatry continues to be a major force in the culture and continues to be considered a go-to authority for mental issues what what can you see happening well we already have the disaster and yeah, it's yeah. it's difficult to imagine it can become worse but it actually does become worse year by year the consumption of psychiatric drugs is still increasing and bob whitaker has shown that in all countries he has looked at when the consumption of psychiatric drugs increase the number of people who end up on disability pension because of mental health problems also increase. So this tells you exactly what psychiatric drugs do. They render people incapable of living a normal life and contributing to society. Mm. They render them passive. So that's why I hope we will reach a tipping point before too long where the whole house of card will fall down. Mm. This is what we need. We need a future where we use very, very little psychiatric drugs and only in hyperacute situations for a very short time mm. and only if the patients want it. Mm. We must abandon forced treatment that is a horrible human rights violation. Hmm. How about best case scenario? You kind of alluded to that just now, you know, with the house of cards falling. But what do you see as like some of the 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 the, the way forward? What action steps can we take and how will mental health treatment look like in the best case scenario? I have speculated a lot how we can change psychiatry. And you cannot work with the silverbacks in psychiatry, those at the top. Mm -hmm. They want to defend the specialty's interests. Mm. You can't work with them. Uh, you need to count on the young psychiatrists who are on their way and who have not been so brainwashed as the old ones and can still see the light and can still see there's something totally wrong with this system. Mm. But my best hope is to launch uh, class action lawsuits. For example, I have just heard about a person in the United Kingdom who has this um, idea that he will make class actions on behalf of psychiatric patients that have been seriously harmed in the National Health Service in the UK. Because if we can win some cases and they cost taxpayers a huge amount of money in settlements, I mean, we are talking about millions of people who have been harmed by psychiatric drugs. Then the managers and even the politicians will realize that now they need to radic radically change the system because they cannot afford all these fines and settlements mm. for damages. I must say that everything else I can think of, I wonder if it will be effective. The only thing that is effective is if it costs people a lot of money. Mm. Psychiatry is driven by money. The, the drug companies cheat on us. They corrupt us. It's all about money. So we must use the same weapon against the system and make the system pay a lot of money for damages. Mm. I don't think it will change before we succeed with that. 
Mm. Do you think there is any, um, any hope in broadly educating the public about yes. this? Yes. Sort of, sort of bottom up approach. Yeah. As well. Yeah. It's good that you mentioned this because uh, that's actually my other hope. Mm. Counting on all those patients that have been so badly harmed mm. or even killed and count on those left behind. But this is also very difficult because the indoctrination is so huge that if you stop an ordinary person in the street, you might get some rosy story about this drug helped my sister or whatever. But yet I write on the first page in my new book that the general public believes that depression pills, antipsychotics, electroshocks and admission to a psychiatric department causes more harm than good. It's more harmful than beneficial. This is also what the science tells us. So if you go out and ask 2000 people, most of them will actually tell you that what happens in psychiatry is harmful. But then why don't they protest? Can you tell me where are they? It's hmm. a good question. Like where? Yeah, we should, where? Arrange, we should arrange huge demonstrations all over the world. Hmm. Take down psychiatry and build a new one. If a house is totally rotten, you don't call for uh, repair work. You take it down and you build a new one. Yeah. And That's what, where we are with psychiatry. And to me, what, what is good news is that there's a well-built house called psychology, you know, right, oh, yeah. down, right down the street. That, yeah. so, so that people don't have to have this feeling of, well, if we dismantle psychiatry and rebuild it from the ground up, what will we do in the meantime? There are other options, specifically uh, psychotherapy. You know, so oh, yeah. I, I think, and, and you suggest that's the first step people should take, right? If they have. Oh, yeah. Place. And you should also be prepared to change your psychotherapist if it doesn't work out, out well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are not all equally good. And it also depends on the kind of relationship that you build with that person. So then you might try another one. But you, you don't need to have an education as a psychologist or psychotherapist. Uh, if you take an interest in your fellow human beings, mm. you can also help them. Yes. Beautiful. Well, I, I, I definitely um, believe without a doubt that you have already and will we'll kind of go down in history as a major change agent and a just a source of informing and empowering and educating the public really like you're 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 among the elite when it comes to doing that and i'm super grateful for everything that you've done and continue to do well i'm also grateful for your interview because the more i can spread the knowledge that we have the better so it can empower people Mm. to take responsibility for their own lives and not hand it over to their psychiatrist. That the, that's the worst thing people can do. Mm. So just to say again, because as, as we wrap things up here, I, I'm sure there are, if, if anyone's still listening now, <laughs> I'm sure someone is, then I'm sure they'll want to learn more. So where can people find you and your work? Can you say your website again? Yes, it's called scientific freedom in one word, dot DK. DK means Denmark, not something that is decaying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it's easy to find. Uh, just search on my name and you will quickly find it. Perfect. And I'll... I'll be sure to put a link in the description as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, this has been, you know, really enjoyable and enlightening for me. And I appreciate you just, you know, sharing your insight and, and listening to my points as well. And this has been a very thought provoking conversation. And I feel like it's just productive, like it can help bring about positive change. So feeling a lot of gratitude and um, I hope we can stay connected and maybe speak again sometime in the future. Oh, yes. Yes, you might you might arrange a video conference with Bob Whittaker, Jonah Moncrief and me and Sammy Timimi from the UK. I love that idea. Yes, love that idea. Cool. Well then, I'm sure you'll be hearing from me again soon. Okay, thanks. Again, it's 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 an honor because you know you're you're a you're a major figure and I, I figured you'd gotten many requests. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Nick, and for your good questions. Thank mm. you. You're very welcome. Okay, we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.